265 in your book. 265. Love lifted me.
job. Thank you guys so much. I want to get into the Word tonight as we continue on our study, the Rapture. Um, somebody uh, was sitting and eating or at lunch yesterday with somebody in Lions Club, and, uh, or no, maybe it was Monday night. We were um, at a Lions Club event, and and he um, saw our, our YouTube on the Rapture Part One last week. He said, "Well, how many parts of the Rapture are there?" And um, and I said, "I said that's just the teaching, not the Rapture is going to be in two parts." Uh, and I, said, obviously, he did not watch the video. He just saw the title. Um, so this is the rapture part two tonight. Um, there aren't really two parts of the rapture, okay, just so you know up front. The rapture is a singular event. Um, tonight I put a little clock on it, and, um, you know, they, um, you've heard of the doomsday clock, so to speak, that has, um, has it sitting at 11.55, 11.66, or 56, um, and, and so forth. Well, I've got it, it, it the clock at, at midnight there. Uh, I guess it could be 12 noon, but that, it, it's going to be midnight because I do believe the rapture is that near that the clock is not just ticking, the clock is almost to its end there for that. Here's what we're going to start. I'm going to start with this key verse. And I, I love this passage right here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And the last verse says, Therefore comfort one another with these words. What a great passage. In fact, this passage, it talks about one rapture, one group of people going in two different ways. It talks about the people who are who are coming out of the grave going in the rapture and the people who are alive going in the rapture. But of those, everybody that goes in the rapture are people who are Christians. It involves only Christians. I think about this passage and I think about my mom a lot um, because in this passage it says the dead in Christ will rise first and those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet him in the clouds. How many of you know that? So why do you think about your mom? Back about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, my mom had neck surgery. And um, they went and did neck surgery on her, and they put cadaver bones in her neck. Um, they took bones out of a dead person, and they put them in her neck. And so um, I, you know, I said, Mom, do you know if those were the person who died, who got their bones in your neck, if they were a Christian? Um, she does not. I said, if they're a Christian and the rapture takes place while you're alive, your neck's going to go before the rest of you. And so... Um, you know, um, but but if they're Christian, then guess what? You know what? That means that they're that, that means that, that, that they're going to go in the rapture. If they're a Christian who has passed away, or if they're a Christian who's still alive. Now remember, one of the things that I told you last week is whether somebody is dead or alive physically, if they were saved, if they've been saved, if they are Christian when they live or when they died, they're still part of the church. The, the church is not this physical body. The church is the body of Christ. And those who are in the grave who have who served him are still just as much a part of the church as we who are alive today are a part of the church. And that is exciting to me. It's very important. But, but again, the rapture only involves Christians. And that's going to be the first point that we look at tonight. The rapture only involves Christians. It doesn't involve the rest of the world. The rest of the world is not going to be involved when this thing takes place. This is a singular event that is designed just to take the people of God to be with Him. Each one, each of the three major passages that we've read, that we read last week in, in, in the rapture, um, allude to that and indicate that it only involves Christians. And when I say Christians, let me go ahead and preface that by also saying that includes innocent children and babies who have gone on to the, be with the Lord. I've done the funerals of, 
of babies who were pre-born that died. I've done the funerals of, of little babies who were born prematurely that didn't make it. I've done the funeral of, 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 of little innocent children who were killed in tragedy and so forth. And guess what? Um, they're safe. You know, they, 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 they may, if they didn't have that chance to get their heart right with the Lord, then they are, they, they're going to be part of that. Anyone who doesn't trust in Jesus, though, as the Lord and Savior, will not be raptured. It's that simple. I mean, it, it, it is that real. It's that simple. Um, if, if they didn't trust in him, they're not going to make it. I don't know if, if when the rapture takes place, you know, we've seen all the Left Behind movies. We've seen the Omega Code. We've seen the, the um, uh, if, you, if you were uh, in the 90s, you saw the Apocalypse movies that, that, that were done by um, John Hagee and, and, and their bunch. and Very well done, I felt like. And, um, and you, you saw those. And each one of those, when the rapture took place, had a depiction of clothes being left. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe my Levi's are going to be left. I don't know if they're going to make it or not. I'm not sure if that's going to happen. We saw the depictions of airplanes losing their pilots and, 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 and so forth. We've seen those, those things depicted. I'm not sure if that kind of stuff's going to happen. Though We don't really know. But what we do know is that if they're not saved, they're not going to go. And I don't know what kind of mystery that they're going to come up with, what kind of answer the world's going to come up with when that takes place. And if they're going to say that it's been alien abduction, if they're going to say that it's been spontaneous um, combustion that's taken place on people that have, you know, that, that, that have gone. Um, but the reality is, it's only for the Christians. The lost will not enter the presence of the Lord. And that's a sad, tragic thing. And it should grieve us every time we think about that. We should glory in the fact that the rapture is for Christians. But we should mourn the fact that there aren't more than there are. That's why we should continue working until the day of, that, of, of His glorious appearing. That we should continue working to try to win as many people as we possibly can. Uh, I mean, here's what's going to happen. When the rapture takes place, and, and again, we're, I'm teaching this from a pre-trib standpoint, so, um, you know, not to say that it couldn't be another standpoint on that, but from my standpoint I'm teaching from tonight, when the rapture takes place and then the tribulation begins after that, the people who are left are going to be going through very, very difficult times. And I don't even know that the tribulation word covers it enough. I think that's probably just the only translation they could come up with that would cover the horrors of that time. The horrors of... And you think about how horrible the situations are in the world today. There's a lot of horrible situations that make us think, man, this is terrible. I want you to think about what's, going, what's the world going to look like when the people of God are not in it. The people of God who had sound mind and sound spirits and sound ideas who, who, brought, who brought peace to chaos are not in this world. You kind of think about that. And for those who, 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 who think, well, I'll wait to get saved during the tribulation. Period. Yes, there will be people get saved in the tribulation. But what I believe in my study of scripture is the people who had the chance to hear and and had a gluttony of the word of God like Americans have, will probably be deceived to the point if they couldn't take him now, what makes them think they're going to take him when they have to give up their head? I, you know, and that's the reality. Because in that time, the people who are saved aren't going to be saved by grace. They're going to be saved by their works. And there's a complete difference. We're saved by grace, folks. But when the rapture takes place, the grace part leaves. It goes with it. And so um, those horrors, but you know, Jesus' words in John 14 were spoken, when he, when he spoke in John 14, that great passage which begins, let not your hearts be troubled, his words, he spoke to his disciples, okay? They were men who were his believers. They were the group of people who were his believers. So what did he do? He assured those disciples 
that he would prepare a place for them in his father's house. So they were also members of the family of God, just like you are, just like I am. And in the same way that we're members of the family of God, he assures us of this great thing for us. And what did he assure them? The assurance was this. The assurance was not that I'm making a place for you. His assurance was I will come again to get you. I'm going to come to receive you. Um, and so what a great thing that is. Doesn't that comfort you? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm delighted in the fact that, that um, you know, I know we sing the old song, Mansions o Over the Hilltop, and, and, and that's great. And I know the King James says that there, there's mansions. Um, you know, different translation says many rooms. I'm not sure what our living arrangements are going to be like there. Um, I, you know, I doubt we're going to be in, 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 in houses with, with big giant um, swimming pools and, and, um, and, and hot tubs and, 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 and places to have siesta. I'm pretty sure that, that we're going to be in his presence. And, and so, but the, to me, the most important part of this is not where we go. The fact that Jesus is coming to get us. How beautiful is that? How precious and how wonderful is that? And so this describes that in, in 1 Corinthians 15, which we read to you last week, Paul talked about those who are Christ's at his coming. And that's what Paul said. Those who are Christ's at his coming. That means, again, those who are saved, those who know him at his coming. Verse 1 in chapter 15 he uses the term brethren. We, you know, we used to years ago, they used the term brethren in church. Now we say brother. Well, some people say brother. Now people just say whatever. But, um, but you know, I, I like calling people brother or sister or something about, why do I like calling people brother? Am I in the titles? Not really that I'm in the titles. But to me, brother or sister is a, is a term of affection, right? That means your kinfolk, right? That means you're close. Now, to some people who always fought their brothers and sisters, I guess, you know, when they were kids growing up, it may not be. But, uh, but the fact is, that's, what, that's a term of affection when you talk about that, right? So Paul lists it as brethren in, in, in the very first verse of that. But in verse 58, here's what he says. He concludes the passage by talking about abounding in the work of the Lord, a reference to the believers that we've been abounding in the work of the Lord. And in this passage that we read just a few minutes ago, 1 Thessalonians 14, verse 13, Paul refers to the believers as what? Brethren. And then in verse 14, he says to those who believe that Jesus died and rose again. And in verse 16, as the dead in Christ. And so these passages are clear that the rapture is restricted to believers. Only those who are followers of Christ are going to be taken up into heaven when he returns. Now, the rapture, what we need to understand, the study of the rapture, Brother Eddie, can change our life. It can change the course of our life. It is a source of personal comfort and hope. It should be. For some people, it's a source of misery. Why would it be a source of misery for folks? They're not saved, and they may feel conviction, so it would be a source of misery. We all had that time when maybe we were younger, and we went home, and mom or dad wasn't at the house, and we thought, oh, no, the rapture took place, right? Did, they, did, they, did any of your parents talk to you about the rapture so much you thought it was going to happen when you were a kid? And if you went, you were looking in closets and, and, and looking under, under the bed to see where your parents were when they weren't at home. So, oh, no, the car, the truck's at home, and where are they at? I mean, I, I had panic attacks when I was growing up. I was scared to death. They said, well, you should have been right with the Lord. You know what? I was so scared of hell, I was afraid to go there. I think some people still should be afraid to go to hell. Um, but I did not want to miss the rapture. I, there were times, man, I'd come home from school. I'd get off that school bus. I was 15 years old, and I couldn't find my mama. And, and I, I'd be out crying, not because she was gone, because I thought she'd been raptured, and I'd been left behind. Uh, the other day, Sunday, after after service was over, um, Tanya was talking, and in just a split second, she turned away. I, I turned around and looked where she was gone. I thought, 
I know that rapture didn't happen and I was left here. Um, she was gone. She went to get ready to go eat lunch. And so, don't let the rapture get in the way of El Porto, right? All right. Okay. But Paul, one of the things in our studies of the rapture, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians about it to ease their concerns about their departed loved ones. Doesn't it not ease your mind when you think about the loved ones that you had that have went on, that there's going to be a reuniting in the air? How, how, how neat is that? I love science fiction, but this is greater than any science fiction story that I've ever watched or ever seen or ever read. Here's what I find about the rapture that tells me that it's so beautiful is death isn't final. Death's not the final blow for us. If somebody you know dies, their life is snuffed out on this earth, and they're a Christian, as much as we want them to be with us, it's not always a bad thing. I'm reminded of this statement that as much as, 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 as we regret it, when somebody we love dies, no one in heaven regrets being there. No one in the presence of the Lord will ever regret being in his presence. And so I would never want to call somebody back who went on to be in his presence because death isn't final. It's a, it's, it, it, it immediately moved to life again. There's such a great thing about the, i, I got to hurry, the resurrection of believers who died it's going to reverse the effects of death. Isn't that just so awesome? And that's just as Jesus promised. Just like Jesus reversed the effects of death on himself, it's going to refer, re reverse the effects of death on us. So if you die in this physical body and you serve the Lord, you're going to be all right. Or if you go in the rapture, you're going to be all right. Or if you lose somebody very close to you and they love the Lord, they're going to be all right. Because death isn't final. And so it's important for us to understand that. I think, I believe the rapture is a source of strength for us. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus said. Paul said, he said, comfort one another with these words. In fact, he said he doesn't want us to be ignorant about it. He wants it. That's to me a source of strength. Knowledge is strength, isn't it? And so he doesn't want us to be ignorant about it. So that's important for us to understand. The rapture is for the saved. And there are things that as we look into this, there are three ways that the rapture can impact our life today. Now, I'm sure it can impact us even more. But what three ways can the rapture impact our life? First of all, if we believe in the rapture, we can and should live with expectation. We should expect it. We don't have to have an escapist mentality to be expecting the rapture. The saints of old, these Old Testament um, the people that Paul's writing to, they thought Jesus was coming then. They all believed he was coming in their lifetime. They didn't believe it was going to be um, 2,000 years out. They didn't believe it was going to be two millennium. They believed, they truly believed that, that he said he's coming back. He's going to come back in their lifetime. Well, he's not a liar. He just didn't come back when they wanted. But there's an expectation. God has intended throughout the generations for people to expect this and have an expectation about it. In Paul's letter to Titus, he puts in the words how the expectation of the rapture should impact our lives. I want to read to you some excerpts from Titus here. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Now, so he tells us if we're expecting this thing, if we have this expectation, then we should live soberly, we should live righteously, and godly in the present age. Then he goes on in verse 13 and says, looking for the blessed hope 
and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, what a great testimony this is. People who love God are looking for Him. We're supposed to be looking for Him. And I understand we don't have to stand out on the porch and just look at the eastern sky all day long and wait for it like but we should when in the morning we should get up, we should be grateful God gives us a new day, but maybe at God is it going to be today? What do I need to do to be prepared today? How you know this, the, it may sound to us that that, that that we don't have faith. It may sound to others. I've heard other Christians say, well, well, um, people who who talk about that and they don't have faith. No, I have faith in the rapture. I have a great belief in that rapture and it's so important for me to have an expectation. And as I look at the signs of the time, and although the signs of time don't point to the rapture, they do point to us being in the end times and that points us to the rapture. That points us to the rapture. Again, um, we'll say a little bit more about that in a few moments. But So I love what he says here. And he goes on who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special zealous or people special the people that are zealous for good works so paul is telling us here that in this expectation it ought to also remind us of what jesus did for us Again, why is it that we're expecting him to come? It's one, he told us he was going to come back. The other thing, what did he do for us? What did he do for us? He gave the greatest price. He paid the greatest penalty anyone could ever pay for us. And because he paid that great penalty, then, then, then that's why we're looking for him. You think about it. If, 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 if there was somebody, if you ever had somebody that you were expecting to come to your house to visit, and what happens, ladies, what happens when you have a special guest come into your house? You're going to clean like your hair's on fire, and you're going to make your husband do it too, right? I, I mean, you are. Just a couple of weeks ago, when Josh and Melissa had planned to come and visit, um, you know, well, I mean, Sister Pinky, she's mama. And she says, I've got to have this here, that here. Well, it doesn't have to be there every other time. It has to be here for them. What makes them special? We hadn't seen them in a while. We hadn't seen them in a while. I mean, you know, I mean, what makes them any more special than I am? And, um, and, and they were, there's this anticipation of these uh, of, of these two glorious beings coming to visit us and um, and I don't know maybe it's because he's six four and she's six foot and, you know uh, they, they have this godlike look about them or something I don't know what it is but there's such excitement about it but you know when you have guests you do the same thing don't you you know uh, that's why I never call when I tell somebody I'm stopping by their house I'm going over I'm going to see it the way it is uh, <laughs> I don't give any warning or anything. Uh, I, I'm just going to show up. Uh, but uh, that's why people look out the doors. Oh, no. Here's Brother Pinky. Um, but, no, you, you, you prepare, right? And it's an important thing. And just like you beautify the house for somebody that are special guests coming in, you beautify the house, then you're supposed to be, according to this scripture, that we're supposed to be purifying ourselves and, and changing our appearance for that. And that's what this life as a Christian is supposed to be doing for us, is changing the appearance that we had when we were lost to what we're supposed to look like in Christ. And so that's one of the great things about that. That's part of that expectation. But not only... The, the, that's the first part, living in expectation. We can also and should also live in dedication. I've read that Robert Murray McShane, he's a brilliant young Scottish preacher who died at age 29 in 1843. He wore a watch with the words, the night cometh engraved on its face. Every time that he checked his watch, 
He was reminded that time is marching on. You know, I've never lived in a time where time went backwards. Now, I understand. We know of one instance in Scripture where time moved backwards, right? For Isaiah. And, um, and, and so, for Isaiah the prophet, for King Hezekiah, he moved the, he moved the clock back. And, uh, but, but we also know of one time where he stopped the clock. Where he stopped it, but... That's the only other time in history that we know that he moved time backwards. But every other time, when you look at your watch, it's going forward. And if you've got a watch that's going backwards, you're probably going to have to throw it away. Because it's not any good, right? Which tells me that even though it hasn't happened yet, and I've heard it taught and preached about since I was seven or eight years old, even though I've heard that most of my life, every second that it goes, every minute that we go, it's one minute closer to, as, as this preacher Robert McShane said, the night cometh. You see, here's what we need to understand because time keeps, mar keeps marching on. We won't always have more time to win people to the Lord. I'll win my loved one next week. I'll live, win my loved one tomorrow. Can I encourage you when God places somebody on your heart, don't wait till next week because next week may never come for you. It may never come for them. I, we won't always have time to concentrate on the service that we want to give to the Lord. At some point in time, those things that we want to do for the Lord, there's not going to be any more time left to do. Either through the grave or through the rapture. Say, so why is it, Pastor, that you keep telling us things like, why do you keep giving us projects like, like the, our, 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 our treat project that we're going to do to treat yourself and treat someone else that we're going to be doing on, in November, on November 6th. Why are you, why are you, want, why are you keep telling us that like that? Because I believe that, that, that the time is short, and, and I know that gives, that, that's three weeks out, but I understand, I just believe so much, um, Sister Pat, that, that the time is short, that we need to do whatever we can to invest in the lives of people, and if it means giving them some cookies and it might win them to the Lord, then give them some cookies. Uh, you know, we're not going to be out anything but some sugar, folks. And, I mean, you know, the, if, if it means, if it's the, the fact is, it's opening a door, one other door for us to just try to reach people and for you to try to do something because I don't know how much time there is left, but every second that we spend not doing it is a second that we miss out on. And the watches are keep going forward. And again, my watch has already moved forward four minutes since I started this point. The Apostle John exhorted his readers, he said, not to be ashamed before him at his coming. I don't want to be ashamed in the presence of the Lord when he comes. He said, we don't have to live a perfect life to make the rapture. We don't. But I don't want to be ashamed. I want him to be pleased with me. I want him to be pleased with us. I want him to be pleased with the church. And I, 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 want, I want that because the imminent return of Jesus Christ, that should push us to have the greatest dedication that we've ever had to serving him. Instead of looking for more time and more leisure, we should be looking for more time with him and more time to touch people's lives. Have, have pointed ideas toward that. The third thing, we can live with preparation. Again, preparation is key. At the very end of the book of Revelation, or near the end, we're told in Revelations 22 that he is coming quickly. Now, when John said that he is coming quickly, Folks, it's been 2,000 years since John said those, since he penned those words that he's coming quickly. That means this. 
that we should live every day as if he were coming that day. Not as if he were coming tomorrow. When you go to bed at night, don't anticipate that you're going to wake up in the morning. Anticipate that he could, the trumpet could sound throughout the night. That it could happen. You see, we have to have that earnest belief in that so that we will be ready. That we will be found with heart and hands that are dedicated to serving him at the moment that we see him face to face. And that's the goal, isn't it? Our goal is that we see him face to face. And that's what I'm looking forward to. That's what I believe you're looking forward to. And so um, that we must be sure that, that we do what we're supposed to do in preparing for him. How do I prepare? I need to make sure I'm right with the Lord every day of my life. I need to make sure of that. And then I also want to make sure others. I, I want to be, I want to give a clarion call to the world that reminds them that time is short. John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we need to cry out to this world, repent in preparation. I told you that each week that we do this, I'm going to give you three reasons the rapture could happen today. These, I'm going to give you the same three reasons. I want you to memorize these three reasons. I want you to have them in your heart. The three reasons the rapture could happen today. One, I told you last week, and I tell you again, the rapture is a signless event. Again, there are no signs for the rapture itself. There are signs for the end times, but there are no signs for the rapture. We're told we don't know the day or the hour. There's no signs of that. It's the fact is that, that, that it's an imminent thing about to happen and we don't have to have a sign. There doesn't have to be anything else happen for the rapture to take place. Nothing has to happen for it. It could happen today. It could be 50 years from now or beyond that. But I can tell you what's going to happen. The rapture is going to happen without any warning of a sign. The warnings come from the Word of God and from the men and women of God who throw the warnings out there and from you parents who warn your children or, or, you, uh, or grandparents who warn your grandchildren or people who warn your neighbors. And you know what? If people think that you're kooky for warning them about something that's going to happen, that's on them, not you. I know when you say the word rapture, people are like, what in the world does that mean? That's not your fault they don't know what it means. Then tell them what it means. You're armed with the knowledge, so tell them what it means and how important it is for you to understand it because it could happen today. Jesus isn't going to whisper into your ear, I'm coming back today. He's not going to do it. But he has given us the word that said he's coming back when the Father tells him. Reason number two, that's because the rapture is a surprise event. We talked about everybody. There's some surprises we like. There's some surprises we don't like. There's a surprise of, of elation that you have when, um, when somebody shows up and you didn't know they were going to show up. Somebody you didn't expect to see. Have you ever had somebody show up at your house you didn't expect to and it surprised you for the good. I think that happened to some people this past week. And they had a sister show up that, um, that they didn't know she was coming and showed up. I, I, and, and um, you, know, I, you know, one of the great surprises for me, the first time that I saw my oldest brother walk after he had his accident four years ago, the first time I got to see him walk in public was when those doors opened back there and he walked in this church. I had seen him stand with wobbly legs, but never seen him walk. I'd seen him in a wheelchair. I saw him when he got home from the hospital, but I didn't see him walk with the dawn, but it was in August of 2019. Oddly enough, it was just a few months before our dad would die, and my brother came walking in. Do you want to talk about surprise? That was a beautiful surprise. 
But then I've also had other surprises that weren't so good. You ever had somebody sneak up behind you and jump and scare you to death? Years ago, we were, uh, me and my mom was watching a, a, a movie over at our house. We lived in, out on 312. She was watching a movie and didn't, we didn't have air conditioning at the time, so the uh, windows were up and, and there was some kind of movie that was a thriller. And my mom always liked thrillers. And, and so my mom and dad were in, in, the, in the living room watching that or in the den watching this. And, and me and two of my other friends, we snuck out of the house and walked around. And as it got to a real tense part of the movie, the window was up. We jumped up and we said, boom! And I thought my mama, I thought she was going to fly because she started waving her arms so much. And um, she almost passed out. And um, we almost put her into a cardiac arrest. She was surprised. Well, guess what? For the people who are saved, it's a surprise event like my brother walking in that door. For the people who are lost, it'll be a surprise event because they don't get to go. And then finally, the rapture is a sudden event. That's why I'm so fast. Faster than the speed of light. So powerful to think about that. Faster than the speed of light. When that trumpet sounds, when, when it happens that quick, don't expect a slow-mo flight in the heaven or into the heavens. Expect to go up. And y'all know I like I like airplanes and stuff, and I love the thought of, of flying one, and the, the, the faster you go, the better. I love that. Man, I just think of the G-forces that are going straight up. And it's not going to be this gravity can't hold us down. What a great, powerful thing that's going to be. It's going to be, it's going to be that sudden event that happens so very fast. And it could happen today. According to Titus chapter 2, Jesus said, he gave himself for us, or Paul said, Jesus gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. What lawless deeds do we need to be confessed? How ready are we for the rapture? And if Jesus returned today, would you welcome him or fear him? I'm going to pray, and I want the people that, I want to be able to, that are online who may watch this on YouTube. We don't know who will watch this on YouTube later. Hopefully, there'll be somebody that doesn't know him that will watch it. I want to pray for them that they have an opportunity. Would you bow your heads as we close this out? Heavenly Father, I pray right now for somebody that's lost, that they would ask him into their hearts, that they would pray a simple prayer like this, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin and save my soul. Lord Jesus, I confess you as my Lord and Savior to serve you all the days of my life. Today, I want to prepare myself for your imminent return. Today, I know I am saved. I give myself freely, just as you gave up yourself freely. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to pray for you right now that are saved. And I want to pray this for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for those